Hello AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here for video number four with example four of topic 3.3, finding derivatives of inverse functions. And now we're going to take a look at what I refer to as method three, which honestly, for lack of a better name, is the shortcut. It's probably the most streamlined way that you can take the derivative of an inverse function. And it's a way that you're probably going to have to know for the AP exam. And you'll see why as we move into some other videos over this particular topic. So let's dive right in here. Now I've left the work up from my previous example three, from a, a video three over the series, because I want to kind of relate to it just a little bit. So I'm going to move my camera in a little bit better position here. And I'll refer back to some of the work that I did in this example as we move through our fourth example. But it says it is possible that method two, which is what I've been showing here in the last couple of videos, can be streamlined by using this formula. And, and this formula is what I refer to as method three. And I know it's, it's a very intimidating formula. And a lot of times students will look at that and they'll think, oh my gosh, there are too many symbols. I don't understand it. I know a lot of teachers that look at this and say, oh, too many symbols. I don't want to to deal with this but really if, if you kind of progress through what I've tried to do with the method one and method two it makes method three in this formula a lot more understandable basically that says that you've got a function f differentiable on some interval i and if f has an inverse function f f inverse then f inverse is also differentiable for any x and we also realize that the f inverse uh, uh, evalu I'm sorry, f prime of f inverse of x can't be zero, and that leads us to this particular formula. And, and the reason why that statement had to be made is we have to make sure that this denominator is not zero. So I'm going to talk a little bit about you know what each of these little notation marks means and how we can use this formula. But let's just go ahead and dive right into example four, and I can kind of scroll back and forth a little bit and show you which which components of this formula are, are readily seen in our example three. So we're supposed to find the derivative of the inverse function of f of x equal x plus the sine of x at x equal pi. Well, the first thing that we want to do is probably go ahead and consider the idea of having taken an inverse. In other words, we can go ahead and flip flop our x's for y's and write it like this. Now, this is about the only thing that this method has in common with our previous methods, because we're not going to take the derivative of both sides implicitly. We certainly could, but the usage of this formula is going to be a lot quicker, and that's what we're setting out to do. So if we look at this, it says, okay, what, what is f inverse prime of x? Well, that's just notation that we had used long ago. And we would say, okay, in this case, f inverse's derivative of x by definition would be 1 over the derivative of f evaluated at some inverse. And I want you to think of this inverse value as being a y. I mean, why not? Isn't it replacing basically something that has f notation inside of it? And we've always known that f of x is y. Now, we're going to go ahead and be able to say that f inverse of x is y as well. And the reason is because we've already slipped into the inverse world. So when we say find the derivative of the inverse function of f of x at x equal pi, we're already accepting the fact that we have an inverse and we're going to use this x value. So that means f inverse of x is some y. So what that means is we would simply take the derivative of our original function, which we can probably see that that's just 1 plus the cosine of x. However, we're going to use the y variable version of that. So we'll call it basically 1 plus the cosine of y. And there we have a very legitimate generic derivative of an inverse. 
Now, if you think about what connection does this have to our previous example, and I tried to color code this in the same way, but if you look at this line right down here from example three, I've got my derivative of the inverse equal to one over, okay, well, I remember this one over didn't come about because of some formula. It came about from taking the uh, implicit derivative from the, the previous three steps here. And then if I look at the denominator, well, that denominator is nothing more than the derivative of my original function f of x, but I slipped the y value in for the x value. So now that I've got that established, we can then dive right into evaluating this. So notice we've already had to do two steps of work in place of these four steps that I had previously. Now, the part that's always a little bit tricky is this situation here, where if I give a students a pi in for x, that means I have to solve that new inverse equation for the y. Now, this is our first problem that we've done, at least together, that does not have a calculator icon. So we cannot solve this using a calculator. And that can cause a little bit of anxiety, but you have to understand if problems like this are given to students, let's say on an AP exam or on some kind of resource that's been vetted and edited well, that means that it's going to have to have a really nice answer. And so teachers, if you're going to write these own problems and decide to not let your students use a calculator, make sure that the students can very easily solve for why by using probably some guess and check method. For example, I would just have my students try various values of y to see if this makes sense. Uh, zero is always a favorite of mine. So we're going to try y equals zero and just see what happens. And upon doing so, I end up with pi is equal to zero plus the sine of zero, which I think is going to say that pi is equal to zero, which is, uh, that's false, right? that's no good. So I just go back to the drawing board and try another value. Now sometimes we might try values like 1 and 2 and negative 1, negative 2. Usually by then it, things are going to work out. But in this case we're probably wanting to deal with radian values because we have a trigonometric expression here, sine of y. So I don't know, maybe pi over 2 strikes you as a nice uh, radian measure that that could work. Uh, if we try that, pi is equal to pi over 2 plus the sine of pi over 2. Now, I think we're maybe getting a little closer, but still not there because pi over 2 um, plus the sine of pi over 2, I believe is pi over 2 plus 1, which isn't quite pi. So you think about something else. Uh, maybe we go all the way to y equal pi. Um, I know you could also think about using pi over 4, pi over 6, pi over 3. Usually I might go back to those once I try pi. But I have a, I have a really sneaky suspicion that we're going to be in good shape here. Because pi plus the sine of pi is just pi plus 0, which we know is pi. So we have a winner there. So we, we've gone through a few steps here just to do a trial and error guess and check procedure to come up with an answer. And I also want you to not um, read too much into this, but it is just a coincidence that the x value of pi happens to match our y value of pi. That will not happen every time. Um, I like this example for another reason that you're going to see here towards the end of the problem. That's why I kept it like this, but I always want to preface that uh, before I continue anymore with my students, that it's not always going to be the case where those match. When we go to example five in my next video, that certainly isn't going to be the case at that stage. So what do we do next? Um, well, um, we answer the question. <laughs> we finish the problem, basically, because now we know that we're going to find this derivative inverse when the x is pi, and by our definition, we get 1 over 1 plus the cosine of whatever that y value was that we found, which just coincidentally is pi as well. So I kind of want to make it worth noting that the pi from the original question is going into this slot here, and the pi that we found from our solution is going to go into this slot. 
And then when we finish this, we know that the cosine of pi is equal to negative 1. And so we have 1 over 1 plus negative 1, which, whoa, what, what? 1 over 0. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? And basically, we know that that's undefined, right? We know that that does not have any kind of value. And basically, what that says is we don't have an answer. Uh, we can look at this a lot of different ways. Um, one, one way that you can address this, you could say that this derivative does not exist. That's perfectly acceptable because of giving this value. And maybe, maybe I'll write that as my final answer here, does not exist with my DNE. But I really would like to give a, bet, a better visualization of why that this, this is really happening in this particular problem. And we'll do that graphically, and then we'll come back and kind of tie everything up. So once again, I'm going to go ahead and go to a scratch pad, a graphing screen. You could do this uh, pretty much on any kind of a, a machine that you're using. Desmos works well as well. So you have x plus the sine of x. And so that was the original function. Notice that this function is one to one. It's strictly, uh, it's mon monotonically behaved. It's always doing the same thing, either increasing or decreasing. And we can thus take its inverse. And then I'm going to go ahead and go into the menu window or graph entries, edit, and choose relation. And so I can just swap my x's for my y's here. And so I would be looking at, say, that particular function. And so that I can kind of give these a little bit of variation, let's change the color of this inverse to red. So we're going to focus on the red function here. And we are going to figure out what its derivative is, what the slope of its tangent line is when x is pi. Now, I don't like the fact that my... my um, uh, scale along the x-axis is in increments of integer values of 1, so I can change that a variety of ways. One, one way that's probably a little less confusing is just to go into the window settings and just change this scale here. Uh, why don't we just kind of make this go from um, negative 2 pi to positive 2 pi. You can type in pi. The Inspire will understand what we're thinking. And I'll use a scale of pi over 2, let's say. And just to make sure, I'll use a scale of 1 here for my uh, y values and keep them at defaults. So here's what the graph would look like at that point. Hopefully we see that pi would be located right about here. And if I look at trying to find the tangent line there, I notice that, whoa, that's interesting. What kind of thing is happening there? It's a pretty steep tangent line. I wonder if that's a vertical tangent line. And it turns out that it is. <laughs> we actually did the work to show that this tangent line is undefined or has an undefined slope. And the only way that that's going to happen when you have a continuous function like this is typically typically when you have an, um, a slope that's going to be uh, vertical or a line that's going to be vertical. Now, that's not the case for everything. I know some of you might be thinking, oh, what about x to the 2 thirds? And there are some exceptions, but it's pretty clear in this case that we have uh, a point that's not going to serve as some kind of a sharp turn. Um, if I try to use um, my geometry tool, I can give that a try. I need to make this a document. So I'll just really quickly shift this into a new document here. And I can then access my geometry tools. But I have a feeling I've tried this many times, and I'm probably going to be a little disappointed here. Uh, let's do that one more time geometry, points and lines. I want to choose tangent here. And we'll use the red curve. But as I move closer and closer to that point where x is pi, take a good look at the slope. 1.42, 1.78. Eh, it's growing, but not terribly fast. But boy, by the time I get closer, this slope starts to really take off on me and get larger and larger and larger and crazy large. And by the time I get there, Looks like the slope is 529 and some change. Well, it's very difficult for the calculator to lock in right at that specific location. There, I got 61,000 as my slope. So you can see that the calculator is trying to call this something really large. And we're going to go ahead and write that off as certainly being an infinite slope. So that's why we're going to go ahead and call this answer 
does not exist or undefined because we don't have the value of the derivative of the inverse at that stage. Um, it's really going to be important that you work with this formula. You take your time with it. You practice it. Don't blow it off. It's going to be um, easy to let it sink in if you've practiced it just a little bit. And of course, when a lot of time goes by from the, from the moment that you've learned this until the time you take the AP exam, you're certainly going to have to review. I find with my students, I don't have to review this very much at all. Five, 10 minutes, boom, it comes right back to them. And uh, my students really get a kick out of uh, discovering how really well they can do on the multiple choice question uh, that deals with this formula, even though it has sort of dismal um, success rating across the nation. As far as a little bit of a mnemonic device to memorize, this might be kind of silly, but I do have kids that kind of get confused by this notation. And so I use the uh, uh, old uh, mnemonic IDDI. I for inverse, D for derivative. So you can see that I have an inverse notation here, a derivative notation, and then underneath a derivative notation, inverse, it's just backwards. It's like a palindrome. And that helps them put these pieces into the right spot. Anyway, I hope that this helped. We do have uh, another example that deals with this method three from a generic function standpoint. And then we're gonna finish up with another couple of videos that address how to use this uh, particular approach when you're given a table of values, which is really commonly seen on the AP exam. Anyway, I hope this certainly helps and we'll see you next time.